succinctly and immediately introduce Barry Lynn from the New America Foundation, author of Cornered, and the subtitle of Cornered is? The New Monopoly Capitalism. The New Monopoly Capitalism. Barry Lynn, please pay careful attention. Thanks, oh, David. Jeez, and, uh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. I guess, uh, unfortunately, now I get to put you all off your lunch just by actually expanding the scope of the problem. But uh, one of the benefits I have is that I get to follow Evan and uh, at the very end of his Q&A session, he said something to the effect of, you know, what we need to start doing is speaking about these problems not in the language of licensing but in the language of political economics. And that's what the thing, that's one of the things I've been doing these last few years. And I think to start that process, it may be worth going back to the year 1773. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about tea parties, and I figured actually let's take a little quick look at the tea party. Uh, specifically, uh, a letter that was signed in 1773 by two fellows named Sam Adams and John Hancock. And they, in this letter, they assailed the Tea Act for being, this is a quote, introductive of monopolies which, besides the trains of evil that attend them in a commercial view, are forever dangerous to public liberty. America was born not of a fight against taxation. That's just a useful myth. America was born of a fight against monopoly. And it was not because monopolies are bad economically. It was because monopolies are dangerous politically, because they concentrate control, they concentrate power. The goal of the founders, or at least that populist wing of the founders, Franklin and Jefferson and Madison, was a nation composed of self-governing, independent citizens living in a community of rough equality. Or as the folks down south might say, what they wanted was that there be no bosses. You know, and for 200 years in this country, we did a pretty good job of keeping ourselves free of the bosses. Most dramatically, we did so through an act of war at the, against the slavers and the states they had captured control over. Day to day, we did so using this great suite of anti-monopoly laws that we developed at the local level and the state level and eventually at the federal level. You know, we used these laws to distribute power where we could and to harness power where it was needed to keep that power together. You know, think, for instance, of the Postal Service Network. What did we do with that monopoly network? In the Constitution, we ensured that that public would contain, remain in control of that monopoly network. Yet, yet, yes, there were periods when the bosses actually did rule, you know, the plutocratic bosses and the Tammany bosses, but we should consider what the Americans achieved, what we, the Americans, achieved in the 1930s. This was a time when every other industrialized people were falling under autocratic militarism, even totalitarianism. And at this time, the American people went in the exact opposite direction during the Second New Deal. We distributed power. We further democratized our economy. You know, the great achievement of America was not prosperity but liberty. Our phenomenal prosperity is merely a testament to that liberty, a testament to the fact that we enjoyed complete freedom to connect with our neighbors within our own communities, in the town hall, and in the open market. It's a testament to the fact that there were no lords governing our labor, no lords who could simply take our ideas from us. You know, a mere generation ago in this country, in the late 1970s, true democracy was still on the march a mere generation ago, American citizens were still opening up the industrial firm by introducing new forms of governance to distribute power, and the media by devising new ways to decentralize control, and the Cold War state itself. At the height of the Cold War, passing laws like the Freedom of Information Act and the Foreign Surveillance Act, a mere generation ago in this country, the American people ruled. We ruled our nation, we ruled our communities, and we ruled our own selves. Now let's compare that with what existed a, ge what existed a generation ago with what we got today. Now I'm going to start with retail. 
You know, a generation ago, no one firm controlled more than 5% of any line of business in America. Today, Walmart alone controls upwards of half of many lines of business in America. Amazon alone controls upwards of 80% of some lines of business in America, not least the ebook. Consider farming. A generation ago, four, the four biggest packing houses controlled 25% of the meat business. Now, 90%. Seeds. Then the business was dispersed among more than 50 companies. Now a single company, Monsanto, dominates. Manufacturing. Back then, it was rare to find a firm that controlled more than a quarter of any major activity. Today, single co companies control upwards of half the business of making airliners, washing machines, windshield wipers, paint pigments, bottles, detergent, even toilet paper. We see near complete monopolies in semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, high-grade glass, electronics assembly, oil rigs, lab equipment, even razor blades. Air transport. Then there were 10 major carriers and dozens of regionals. Today we're down to three. Banking. Then every single major city in this, this country had multiple big banks. Today we have five banks that control more than half of all the financial assets in this country. And I haven't even bothered to talk about the power of the companies you all know so well, Microsoft and Apple and Oracle and AT&T and Comcast. So what does all this consolidation mean? Higher prices? Yeah. Less variety? Yes. Worse service? Yes. But let's look at this also politically. In 1787, John Marshall, the guy who went on to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he distilled the issue down to the simplest of questions. In any instance where the choice is whether to allow power to be concentrated or not, Marshall said we must ask, and I quote, is the power necessary and is it governed? Is the power necessary and is it governed? Let's look at Google and ask that question. Is the power necessary? No. Is it governed? No. Citibank, is the power necessary? No. Is it governed? No. Walmart, as we learned just in the last few weeks, not only is Walmart's power not governed, but the people who are in control of that power are using that power actively to subvert the rule of law in Mexico and in the United States. Amazon, if you look closely at this company's mastery of online sales and their mastery of physical delivery, you know, just last year they spent $5 billion on warehousing, and their vertical integration into the direct ownership of the products they sell, we see a company that is destined soon to make Walmart look puny. Hmm? Add to that the, the mass of the information that Amazon has captured over those who supply the products and those who buy them, namely us and us. And we see a single company that's vastly more powerful than any 19th century railroad. It's a multi-dimensional Goliath empowered by technologies that were unimagined by any mere Morgan, any mere Rockefeller. Is this power necessary? No. Is this power governed? Lord, no. Now maybe one might think this concentration of control makes us somehow more safe in this ever more complex world. Maybe somehow this concentration of power makes the world more peaceful. You know, well, my day job these last 10 years has been precisely to study the effect of concentration on the uh, functioning of complex systems, industrial systems. And the short answer is no, concentration does not make the world any more safe or any more peaceful. If anything, this concentration results in exactly the opposite greater fragility of these systems, a greater likelihood of catastrophic crashes. That's because in concentrating power, the monopolist and mercantilist concentrates also capacity and risk. I mean, uh, concentrates capacity and debt. And whenever you concentrate capacity and debt, you also concentrate risk. When you concentrate risk within a global system, it means that a disaster in one place be it financial or political or natural, can swiftly become a disaster every place. 
You know what too big to fail guarantees? It guarantees failure. It guarantees collapse, if not today, tomorrow. If we dare to look at our America of 2012 with honest eyes, we have no choice but to admit that we have betrayed the blood of the generation of the founders, and we have betrayed the blood of those who fought the slavers, and we have betrayed the blood of all those who fought the fascists and the militarists, and those who fought the antique bosses right here in our own land. We have sold all these fantastic this fantastic inheritance of liberty for a few trinkets, a few cheap entertainments. A mere generation ago, in this land, we governed ourselves as individuals, as communities, as a nation. And now in almost every economic realm, we find ourselves governed by, subject to, distant and increasingly awesome private powers who have fenced us in and who now alternately milk us like cows in confinement sheds and pit us in our labor against our neighbors in tournaments. This is actually a new economic term of, term of art, the tournament. And these are in many ways as degrading as anything we saw in slavery. A generation ago we were free, we were sovereign, Today we are other men's chattel, other men's entertainment. There is good news. The good news is that we shall restore our republic and our democracy and our rightful liberties. We did so once before. We made a democratic republic once at the end of the 18th century. We made a democratic republic here again in the early years of the 20th century. We shall do so a third time. And this time we shall do so arm in arm with our friends from around the entire world. How? Well, some say that our main challenge is to get money out of politics. You know, others say it's to make our tax system more fair. Others that we must break up the banks or cut regulation. You know, Susan Crawford yesterday said we must act less selfishly. Yes, 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 and yes, we must do all of these. And all the while, we must also protect our freedom to connect our souls one to another, our thoughts one to another, as all of you in this room fight every day. But first, we must recognize that in every instance, these are more, mere symptoms of a deeper problem, a twofold problem one of self-conception and of law, of understanding who we are, hence what has really been done to us politically, hence how we get what we need now politically. You know, recently there were some scientists over at the Library of Congress who used spectral imaging to study an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. These scientists discovered that Thomas Jefferson had initially referred to his fellow Americans as subjects of government. And that Jefferson had then carefully scratched out that word subject and wrote in the word citizen. He scratched out the word subject and then wrote over it, right over it, the word citizen. This is one of the most revolutionary acts of the revolutionary era. The subject exists under government. The citizen is government. The subject petitions power. The citizen grants the use of power. The subject passively consumes. The citizen produces goods and ideas and work. It was this conception of ourselves as citizens that taught us how to make ourselves free. It was this conception of ourselves as citizens that taught us how to use our anti-monopoly laws day after day, year after year, for two centuries to make markets, to engineer competition, to distribute power, and thereby to protect our liberties and our democracy. But a generation ago, a generation ago, a strange group of activists from the hard left and the hard right, from the statist left and the estatist right, joined their voices to make a case that our anti-monopoly laws were somehow inefficient, somehow wasteful, 
They made a case that our anti-monopoly laws were somehow harming our interest as consumers. And I'm not joking. This actually happened in 1981 during the early months of the Reagan administration. The estatist right, led by the intellectuals of the Chicago School, and the statist left, left uh, led by the intellectuals of the School of John Kenneth Galbraith, the socialists, they held hands together, as together they crossed out the word citizen from the guidelines that our technocrats in government use to enforce, determine how they're going to enforce our anti-monopoly laws. And in place of the word citizen, they wrote in the word consumer. What was the effect of this so subtle editing? of those so fundamental laws, the effect was to flip these laws on their heads, invert them 180 degrees, to turn them from a tool of freedom to a tool of enslavement. To understand how this worked, we need only compare the goal of our anti-monopoly laws for the first 200 years in America to the goal to which they've been put these last 30 years. For two centuries, the goal of anti-monopoly law was to protect our liberties, to protect our democracy. The means, for, the means for achieving this was competition. The means for achieving this was to distribute power. The means for achieving this was to make open markets. 30 years ago, the hard left and hard right declared that the overarching goal would be the welfare of the consumer. And this set into motion a very different sort of chain of reasoning. The welfare of the consumer measured how? Lower prices. Lower prices are achieved how? More efficient organization. Greater efficiency, how do you get it? Well, that means you have to get greater scale and scope. That means more autocratic rule, both inside and outside of the corporation. You know, I actually don't expect you to take my word that consumer welfare is simply another way to say efficiency. We can take the word of Ronald Reagan's first antitrust enforcer, a guy named William Baxter. In those hearings back in 1981, Baxter said he wanted to swap out the old goals of antitrust, and he wanted to replace them with, quote, an antitrust policy based on efficiency. It was only a couple years later that they came up with this more friendly concept of consumer welfare. Now, efficiency, remember, is the same word that John D. Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan used to defend their personal and private power. Efficiency, we must remember, is the exact same word that Louis Couture's used to defend his personal and private power. It's the exact same word that Stalin used to defend his personal and private power. Efficiency was, we should remember, exactly the word that great Democrats like James Madison and Louis Brandeis said we must never aim at. Brandeis said that we, what we want to aim at is the exact opposite of efficiency. He wanted us to aim at friction. The preachers of efficiency, Brandeis said, are always aiming ultimately at autocracy. They're always aiming ultimately at the capture of personal and private power. And sure enough, in the 30 years since we adopted the consumer welfare test, this efficiency test, we have witnessed the destruction of competition in America, the erection of private monopoly in America, the emergence of incipient autocracy. And yet, and yet, because we allowed ourselves to be taught to see ourselves as consumers rather than citizens. Not only have we failed to stand against this concentration of power, we have actively embraced it. We celebrate it. We reward it with our investments. Some of the most well-meaning public servants today in Washington and in our state capitals like the antitrust enforcers in today's Justice Department, they continue to embrace this idea that the goal of our anti-monopoly law is to promote the welfare of the consumer rather than the citizen. And the result continues to be tragedy. 
Just a few weeks ago, we saw the Justice Department step into the fight between Amazon and the book publishers. Regulators subject to this idea of consumer welfare, who'd they bring suit against? It wasn't Amazon. It was against the victims of that beast. Good people, well-meaning people, doing the devil's work. Good people, seeking to break or harness power, help to concentrate power more often than anything we saw a century ago. Because they are governed by the wrong idea, a bastard idea, conceived in the embrace a generation ago of the hard left and the hard right, the statist left and the estatist right. Here's a huge victory, a huge victory we can win tomorrow. The president could, with a stroke of the pen, restore the old goals of our anti-monopoly laws, those that we held for 200 years. Congress could, with a single vote, restore the old goals. Yet the president won't do so tomorrow, nor will he a month from now, nor will Congress do so next year. None of our representatives will do so until we cease to view ourselves as consumers, as mere subjects of power. Just yesterday, right in this room, we saw a person with an impeccable record, impeccable uh, uh, intentions, Susan Crawford. She concluded her talk with a list of the top 10 consumer demands. It's the wrong way to frame what is happening. It is our freedom of speech that is being taken. It is our freedom to rule our communities that is being taken. It is our freedom to rule ourselves that is being taken. These are rights that are being seized. These are not things. These are not privileges. This is not economic growth. These are rights that belong to us as citizens. A century ago, the statists and estatists of that era they allied around exactly this same argument of efficiency. They allied around exactly the same promise of material welfare for that passive little consumer, for that passive little worker. But the American people then understood that the fight was not for stuff and stimulation. It was for liberty of the citizen from the boss. It was for liberty of the citizen to make a community with one's own neighbors. It was for liberty of the citizen's soul, the freedom to connect our thoughts and our dreams as citizens with one another. America's citizens, because they were conscious citizens, they understood that the fight they were fighting was the highest political fight they could fight. It was a fight far beyond parties, far beyond red versus blue. It was a fight that was religious in nature. And the citizens of that generation harnessed their infinite stores of common sense and their infinite stores of ingenuity to the task, and they won. We shall fight this fight again. We're fighting it now. We shall win this fight again. We're going to win our world again only once we stand again as fully conscious citizens. Anyway, thank you. I have one. Um, Barry, one of the things that really impressed me about your work was um, the... Uh, that consolidation towards monopoly um, makes less redundancy in society. Uh, perhaps you could say a few more words about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I hinted at that in this piece, but I got into this business about, it was actually 13 years ago now, and I was running a magazine called Global Business, and we were writing about how very large corporations were organizing their production systems. 
sort of to take advantage of the new global opportunities. And there was this earthquake in 1999, in September. And suddenly, within about four days of this earthquake, this earthquake was in Taiwan. All these factories all across the United States shut down. Why? This is the global era. Think we were supposed to have more of everything. Yet here was proof, physical proof, that we had less of everything. Everything, uh, in this case, a whole bunch of certain kinds of semiconductors, almost all the production has been concentrated in one town it's called Sinju, about an hour south of Taipei. So that's, you know, I saw that and I said, this can't really be. There's got to be some trick here. There's got to be something I'm missing. And that's what got me into this business. But what I found was that actually uh, no one really understood what was going on because they kind of turned governance over to a whole bunch of different corporations in different places and there was no thought being applied to this system. And so what was happening is that the monopolist in the system, running corporate, private corporations, and the mercantilists, the people running the state of Taiwan, the nation state of Korea, the nation state of Japan, the nation state of, uh, of Germany, the nation state of China, they want power. They want wealth. They want control. And one of the things they do is they go and they sort of use their power to grab hold of certain activities and hold them close. So we've been living through this for coming up on 20 years now. And one of the problems is that within, it's looked at as a system, one of the things that we see is the system itself has been radically stripped out. There's, in many cases, no redundancy. Uh, we just saw it last year what ha uh, with the earthquake in, in, in uh, Japan. There was massive disruptions simultaneously in every industrial country in the world. Uh, in some cases, production was down 20, 30 uh, percent because of an earthquake in one place, not even the center. It wasn't even in the central, uh, central part of the uh, Japanese industrial system. It was way up north. So, um, I think, uh, but that uh, doesn't make us any happier, I don't believe, David. <laughs> so so I, I'd, I'd like to make a suggestion about language, get your thoughts on it. You, you mentioned Jefferson's usage of citizen instead of subject. Mm -hmm. uh, and with specific regard to networks especially, but the networked information economy in general. Uh, I wonder if, if the term consumer really has any, any business in our lexicon, or, or whether we're rather now participants in our economy rather than consumers. No, I mean, the word consumer, if you go back, the word consumer, um, late 19th century, I've done all kinds of... Uh, searching of the use of the word. Late 19th century, very few uses of the word consumer, very technical. It was just this person who's consuming this steel. Um, it was really in the, um, the, the concept of the consumer, as we now know it, was first really thought up in the progressive era by the high progressives, the sort of socialist of that era, the Teddy Roosevelt wing of... Um, you know, and these were people who believed that, well, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was not a trust buster. Teddy Roosevelt was a power taker. He felt, well, these, this guy Morgan who concentrated all this power in this bank over these railroads, that, well, I should have that power. I, Teddy Roosevelt, should be the guy who's telling Morgan what to do with that power. So at that point, with that kind of way of thinking, a bunch of folks who were allied with Roosevelt, a guy named Walter Lippmann at that time, Herbert Crowley, they came up with this concept of consumer as a way of concentrating all of the population into a single force that would be able to sort of bring order to the commercial activity in the United States, to the political economy of the United States. And... Um, so that's, it goes back 100 years, and it was intended uh, for very political reasons, and then it was rejected. People said, this is ridiculous. And then the first two years of the New Deal, a bunch of people tried to restore this concept of the consumer to bring all the people together as a force to bring, so to bring order, to, to control the capitalist and the, late, and the sort of union boss. And again, it was rejected. But then in the 60s and 70s, this concept of consumer was brought back a third time, and this time it was made to stick. And now we're stuck with it, at least until we throw it off. Larry, one last question from Jim Beller. 
Hi, uh, Barry. In the course of uh, uh, battling uh, state barriers to community broadband initiatives over the course of the last few years, we've encountered uh, increasing um, mixing up of concepts by the uh, uh, conservative uh, forces and uh, wealthy opponents on the other side. They've, uh, with some uh, members of state legislators, uh, managed to equate big government with little government and big corporations with individuals. And so they've turned local uh, accessible government into something that is uh, worse than the the big governments and big corporations that uh, would seem to be what their uh, opposition should be to. Uh, how do we? How did that happen? And how do we undo it? That's a great question. And the uh, please, please. okay, the what and sort of easy way to sort of understand this is that, uh, and I'm, when I say this. This is not a criticism of any individual libertarian, any individual Tea Party er. But if we look carefully at the libertarian movement as such, as the Tea Party movement as such, what we see is a movement that's made up of liars and dupes. And those on top, those who are collecting the money, be it in the Cato Institute or wherever they are, in Reason Magazine, at, uh, in the Libertarian Party, they know full well what they're doing. They know full well what they're selling. They know what they're selling is an Orwellian vision. They're in the vanguard of the estatist march. And they've rounded up a whole bunch of well-meaning people to serve as their army. Liars and dupes. And just realize that that's what you're dealing with when you're having these debates. Oh, I knew that. <laughs> okay, thanks to Barry Lynn for a great talk. Thanks, Barry. Yeah.